Hello and welcome to The Gaggle, where we challenge and, if necessary, destroy media narratives. I'm George Samueli. With me today, of course, is co-founder of The Gaggle, Peter Lavelle. And today we have a very special guest uh, joining The Gaggle, uh, Monsieur Jean Bricmont, who is uh, an emeritus uh, professor of physics at uh, the University of Louvain. Um, he's also the author of uh, many books on international relations, as well as quantum mechanics, which is very, very impressive. And, uh, uh, but fortunately, we're not going to be talking about quantum mechanics today. We're going to be talking about international uh, relations. And um, a, a question I want to start off with is something that we've frequently discussed here on The Gaggle, and I don't think we've ever come to a, a satisfactory answer, which is why have uh, the European countries allowed themselves to act so uh, brazenly against their own interests. We understand what the United States is doing. Um, and we understand the United States is acting in its interests and it is very happy to see Europe become subordinate to the United States and the European economy being wiped out as any kind of a, a rival. But where has that European resistance to the United States gone? Because I remember back in the 1960s, we had the goal uh, identifying a distinct European identity to the United States, where in the 1970s and 80s, we had uh, Willy Brandt and Helmut Schmidt, who kind of would, would not go along with um, uh, US policy towards the Soviet Union. Then, of course, we also had conflicts over the Middle East, where again, the Europeans took a very different view of the Middle East conflict from that of the United States. So what has happened? Why is, is Europe now just such a, a meek, submissive uh, creature? Well, <clears throat> I've thought about this question and I have several answers. One is that during the Cold War, let's say after 45, there were two left and two right. The two rights, as you mentioned, the goal was that there was a, a right, which of course was very anti-communist, but uh, was for uh, national independence, and they were certainly not for submitting to the United States. In fact, it's remarkable that the goal for two wars with the Germans was far more anti-American in a sense than anti-Germany, said that German, the Germans were his biggest hope and his biggest disappointment because he wanted to build Europe, a European Europe around the France and Germany, and the Germans did not want that. The Germans wanted to be subservient to the United States and they still want. And the other countries, you know, Italy was weak. I mean, Franco, uh, Spain was under Franco and my country and the others were always very Atlanticist. But then of course there was a right, was sort of more liberal in a free market sense and very pro-American. In fact, the goal was surrounded by people who were quite pro-American like uh, uh, Giscard d'Estaing who came, became president later. There were also two left. Of course, there was the a communist left, which was certainly anti-American, but there were also the left social democrats in Belgium, in England, the left of the Labour Party and so on, who were more, of course, socialist in some sense, and they were also pro-peace, they were pro-détente, etc., as you mentioned, Willy Brandt, and they were, so, and of course, there was also a left, which Mitterrand was an example of, I think, which was completely Atlanticist, I mean, especially in France, the Socialist Party was always, I mean, the socialist, so-called socialist left was always aligned with the United States during the Cold War. So what happened to these two rights and these two left? Well, I think in the 80s, the, the right, the goal is right, completely, not completely, but essentially disappeared because of the appeal of the neoliberal right, the free market right, the Reagan, Thatcher, etc. So there are very, I mean, there are a lot of people who are goalists in France in their heart, but there is no organized movement which would be called Gaullist uh, nowadays in France. In fact, the descendant of the Gaullist party is the Republican, uh, Republicans, the party of Sarkozy, and, and uh, they, they have been totally pro, they have become totally pro-American. And what happened to the other left? Well, they were swung by the new left of the 60s. The new left of the 60s put forward, you know, instead of social and socialist issues and class struggle and so on, it was all the new social movement. So gay rights, women's rights, and all, you know what I'm talking about, which now became wokeism. As far as wokeism is concerned, I just noticed because you must know about her, she's been elected or chosen as prime minister of England, this trust. She has promised to make a, a, a cabinet without any white men. I mean, if that's true, I, to, I just saw it on Twitter a few minutes ago, but if that's true, then you have to ask yourself to what extent are these, you know, woke or 
uh, social movement subversive. I mean, she's very conservative. She's, she's a war hawk. She's awful in many ways. But yet she's totally on the woke agenda. So what, what's, you have to ask all these wokeist leftists to think that that's revolutionary. How could, how come, how come that this is revolutionary and it's adopted by Lee Strauss? I mean, it's, yes. it, it's, it's very interesting, this whole phenomenon, before, before I asked my, my first question, is that um, when you look at from the 1960s to the present, the biggest benefactor of all these social, uh, these, um, these cultural programs and identity issues, white women, boy, they've really come out on top, okay? It's, right. it's really quite remarkable. Um, my first question to you is kind of to dovetail off of George's first. At the end of the day, is it re um, Europe's fate is uh, determined by Germany still, because it, 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 this, this, everything seems to revolve around that. And we, we have never been able to escape, keep the Russians out, the Germans down, and the Americans in. That used to be part of a Cold War ideology, but the Cold War is long over. But does that calculus still play out here? Is, that, is it really the, at the core of how Europe's relationship with the world? Yeah, but one thing I wanted to say also to George's question, and also answer your question, is that I'm not so sure that uh, there is a rational economic calculus or a rational decision behind all this. Mm -hmm. I think it's much more like a religion. It's all more, much more ideological. I'm a very much a follower of Bertrand Russell, who always emphasized that people don't act necessarily according to their economic interests, but also according to their passions. And, uh, and, and, and that's what the case now. The sanctions were taken immediately. Nobody, of course, studied what the effect was. Nobody did the calculation of that. And we are also to mention that Germany, okay, Germany is very influential in the European Union, but nevertheless, the European Union is a bureaucracy, unelected. I think outside of Germany, most people don't know who von der Leyen is. I think everybody in France knows Macron and everybody in England knows Boris Johnson, etc. But nobody knows who von der Leyen is. I don't know in Hungary, do they know that? I don't know. They, they I mean, know her and they don't like her. They don't like her. <laughs> No, but apparently the Germans don't like her. She was terrible as a minister in Germany, but she managed to become, uh, you know, the head of the European Union and, and, and there is nothing you can do about it. And then you can't vote her out, you can't vote against her, there is no... And, and, and then, of course, she makes decisions which go beyond even her, her, her role, you see, her, what the treaty allows her to do. And uh, that's, uh, that's unbelievable. But once these decisions are taken, it's very difficult to... You know they don't have a reverse gear uh, uh, choice. You see, they can't go back because that would be admitting that they were wrong, and that's not something that they're able to do. So now we are stuck. Why, with this. why is that? Why that? That's a really good point. Why can't they say this policy has failed? Why can't they say that as a political class because of their ideological obsession? They can't re recognize a mistake because it's patently obvious. Their, their um, a rash, rapid decision-making process has been disastrous for them. They can't admit they're wrong. But I think they can less admit that they are wrong because they are not elected. They have no legitimacy. Okay. The only legitimacy is their so-called expertise. You see, the goal could say I was wrong. Uh, for example, he, he suddenly uh, got into power by saying that uh, he would support the French Algerians, the French in Algeria, and then he changes, I don't know if he changed his mind, but at least he changed his policy, and it led to independence of Algeria. And of course, he was almost killed for that, but nevertheless, he could change because he had the prestige of being somebody, you know, out of the ordinary. But uh, the, 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 if, if somebody like Van der Leyen says she was wrong, then what is she doing? She can go begging in the street if she, <laughs> I mean, but, what yeah. is she going this to is, do? She has nothing except her expertise and she has no expertise and admitting that she has no expertise would be the end for her. Right, but this is what's so strange is that even from political leaders that we would expect more, so something, uh, uh, you know, Salvini um, said, very hesitantly, well, maybe um, we yeah. should rethink uh, our policy towards uh, Russia. I mean, I'm not saying we should. I, you know, I support all the sanctions and well, I condemn Russia wholeheartedly and whatever. But even he is uh, terrified of uh, breaking ranks. And, and of course, um, Giorgio Maloney, who's the, the ostensible leader of the right, who may well be the next Italian prime minister, she's gung ho. She's still on board with the sanction. I don't know if she'll continue with that, but publicly she's, she doesn't dare 
to break with the consensus. So that's what's so surprising. The people that you might have expected to be yeah. ready to break with the uh, consensus, they're not willing to do so. No, but you see the intellect, that's another thing about which I wanted to say is the change in the media. I mean, there is no opposition media when it comes to war and peace. I mean, there was to the communist media or even social democratic media, or maybe some uh, media on the right. But the, I mean, for example, it's very interesting what happened with uh, Salvini. Salvini said, well, the, actually the sanctions don't hurt Russia and they hurt us. And then what did the leader of the Partito Democratico say, which is the descendant after all of the Italian Communist Party of so many, many stages, but still, <laughs> which would certainly have been pro-peace yeah. if it existed. Then they say, ah, ah we, this is exactly what Putin wants. But it's not true because he just explained that the sanctions help Putin. Right. So it's not even true. I don't think Putin wants to leave the sanction because it uh, fills his coffers. Right. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. I mean, it's really unbelievable how they can be so stupid. And, and, and this transformation of the Italian communist, the Italian left into people who are now fanatically against Russia, although they were pro-Soviet pro Union, moderately so, but still at the time the Soviet Union was after all a dictatorship, et cetera, and was communist, which Russia is not. I mean- how, 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 Can you explain that? How did that come about, that the Italian communist party, which you know, it wasn't part of the, um, you know, it didn't follow slavishly the Moscow line. Nonetheless, it wouldn't go against Moscow. How, how come it's so anti-Russian now? There is the whole evolution of the new left. It's been taken over by this new left and the new left has been very, very, it has created a fanatically anti-communist left. The previous left was not usually fanatically anti-communist. They may have been anti-communist in some ways, but or non-communist, but this thing when you say Hitler equals Stalin and uh, uh, communism equal fascism and so on is something which, of course, nobody back in the six, uh, until the sixties was saying. But of course, the new left, because of their in, also because of their emphasis on individual freedom, because the left now doesn't have any social project of any sort whatsoever. In fact, it's the conservative sometimes of a social project. They, it's all individual freedom. Uh, you need abortion. You need. A, okay, I'm not against individual freedom, but in fact except one thing, which is free speech, because uh, let me give an example about free speech. You may have heard about Ségolène Royal, who is a former presidential candidate. Yes, I read this today, yes. Yeah. And she, she questioned certain events in Ukraine. I don't know, I don't even know what she said exactly, but she mostly emphasized the fact that people use these events emotionally in order to avoid peace negotiation. She didn't challenge, the, she didn't deny, could also deny the Holocaust, deny atrocities and so on. No, no. But, she, she she was and she's been lambasted by everybody or former party member former party socialist party i don't think she's socialist anymore but uh, she's been attacked by everybody and now they're saying people close to bernard Henri levy are saying they're going to sue her in court in court for, for what for what on what basis well the basis is uh, what they use with for his and others in the past incitement to racial hatred i think i don't see anything else i don't see well, any Genocide denial. I mean, is it even one of the law of genocide denial applies specifically to the Nuremberg tri Tribunal, and then maybe to crimes recognized by international courts, etc. Is that that's not completely clear? But here there is no international court that has decided anything, and we are talking about the the Mariupol maternity. We are talking about that, and that's. Still well, open. what she was criticized for is that she said, um, I, I'm paraphrasing here, but you have to take um, uh, Kiev's propaganda with a grain of salt, okay? I mean, this is a heavily propaganda, propagandized conflict here. Yeah. I, I want to go back to trying to understand um, how Europe has lost its way, because it seems to me this anti-Russian mantra is kind of a unifying principle for the elites. And, and, and what we've seen, uh, and, and this is part and parcel of neoliberalism, it's an elite project that all of us are victim of and, and, um, and have to um, uh, experience. And it seems that, you know, this, and you could you do a little bit with this with COVID too, but it's easier to hate the Russians because, well, there's there's been Russophobia in Europe for, for uh, at least in, uh, since the Napoleonic Wars, it's at the very least. So this is kind of a unifying uh, element that kind of gives them cohesion, though they don't realize it's not really working because they're losing, quote unquote, if I can use the, the old term, the masses. Your thoughts? 
Yeah, that's true. I think that there's going to, I mean, it depends how the winter is, but if it's not so very mild, then there'll be a lot of revolts in Europe. We see that already in, in Czechia, to some extent in Germany. It's still very small, but uh, winter is coming and it's not cold here now in France, it's not cold at all. So uh, we have to see how it's going to play out because I can't believe that people will put up with this. I mean, this is so absurd that, uh, I mean, that we should, uh, you know, suffer from sanctions that we impose, and everybody can see that the Russian economy is not suffering from those sanctions. Of course, they deny, of course, the propaganda says, the propaganda says that you know the sanctions work. I mean, they, they keep on repeating on TV the sanctions work, which I don't believe. But uh, yeah, I mean, there is this complete. I mean, it's also interesting. You see, for example, if you take the Poles, the Baltic state, the Ukraine, the Western Ukraine, etc. People say, well, but they suffer from communism. Okay, fine, but did they, are they, you see, are they anti-Russian because of anti-communism or because they were anti-Russian anti all along and even before the revolution? And, right. you know, right. and there's also no real logic there because, you know, if they've suffered under Soviet rule, well, Hungary, you know, you can say Hungary suffered under Soviet rule, but Hungary manages to have good relations with Russia. So there's no you know, logical correlation. Well, I... You know, you have a bad issue with Stalin, and uh, so therefore you hate the Russians. It, it, there's, there's no real logic there. No, no, there is no real logic. But I say even that you can see signs that there was intense. In fact, when I talked to Eastern European, I saw that their anti-communism was often Russophobia. It was really racism with the Russians, whom they considered as some sort of Asia, Asiatic uh, barbarians, and uh, the racism was transparent there. So. Uh, of course, it continued after the, the fall of the Soviet Union, and of course, it existed before that. I mean, there's really, I, I found it strange. I have nothing against Russians. I don't know Russians. Do you think, Jean, that, that this has some connection with the kind of humanitarian interventionism craze that took hold in Europe in the 90s? Suddenly, with the end of the Cold War, you know, Europe suddenly defined itself, hey, we're going to be doing this humanitarian intervention yeah, yeah. stuff. And then Blair embraced it. And most of Europe embraced this idea, you know, the, the, the you know, the, uh, you know, the Greens, you know, the, the Joschka Fischer and so on. Are the, worst. the Greens are the worst. The Greens are the most. <laughs> no, but they are the most fanatical. They are unbelievable. In fact, it's interesting to see now Sarah Wagenek says that they are going to have demonstration in front of the Green office against the war because they are the worst. They are saying, no, well, what matters is the Ukrainians. Now, if the Germans are happy, uh, so be it. But you see, you're, you're an expert, uh, George, on uh, Yugoslavia. But, uh, you know, if you take the war of uh, 99, um, I mean, if you take the logic of it, then, of course, they say we went to war because Kosovo, obviously, the Kosovo didn't want to be under Serb rule, which is probably true. Uh, but then why do the people in Ukraine, in the, uh, in the Donbass or in Crimea, want to be under Ukrainian rule? Obviously, right. they don't want either. So right. the Russians, in fact, the Russians say that, Putin says that, they go, they do their own humanitarian war. So if you don't make rules, and at least the only rule I would see is that one should have a spirit of compromise, and I think the Serbs were willing to compromise, and the Ukrainians, the West Ukrainians, the Kiev regime, has not wanted any compromise since 2014. And uh, so, I mean, now we're in a mess, we're in this war, and I don't know how it's going to end. But uh, the war was uh, sort of, I mean, if the Kosovo war is justified, then the Russian war is even more justified. And of course, the war on Libya was even less justified because there, there was no uh, minority really that was, uh, you know, claiming independence or something like that. No, they ever found, a, they ever found a, a substitute for uh, communism or something like that, which was or socialism, which is of course the social movement, and then this what I call humanitarian imperialism. They, 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 they have, but you see, all these things are very ideological. I think if you're a, a good German capitalist, you are probably not happy about what's going on. But what could they do? What could they say? Suppose they say something, then they're putting, 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 because. As I say, the, the, when uh, Salvini made this remark, then uh, the left says, oh, put in, put in. The, uh, immediately, if you open your, and uh, Salvini Royal, I mean, she has nothing to do with Putin. <laughs> but, you know, they, they're associated, you're associated, I'm uh, myself, of course, I'm associated with Putin all the time, but I was already with uh, Saddam, Gaddafi, everybody, people whom I don't know who they are, basically, but we don't see each other. I mean, you know, I mean, they, 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 they do that all the time. And, uh, so it, it exerts an extraordinary 
uh, intellectual terrorism. Because I noticed that in the case of Ségolène Royal, for example, no segment of the left, the parliamentary left in France is going to defend her, even her right to free speech. And even though she's taken to court, nobody, I, I, I am willing to bet that nobody is going to defend her, her right to speak, free speech. And that's just a complete court. George and I have um, obviously talked a great deal about the conflict in Ukraine. And it seems patently obvious to the George and I that um, at, the, at this stage in the conflict, it's the, the Russians um, are, it's the, Rus it, the Russians have their timetable and they're going to go about their business as they see wish, as they wish. And they will get the outcome that they want. Because I think, unfortunately, uh, I mean, the Western media coverage is, is just, um, disastrously propagandized. But we have to remember that the, the, the predicate for Russia to uh, conduct its special mi military operation in Ukraine was out of security uh, um, interests, okay? The Russians made it very clear, we can go back to December 17th, that they had their demands, ultimatum, whatever you wanna call it, it's fine with me. Um, and if you don't listen, and don't react and don't interact with us, don't negotiate with us, then we will resort to military technical means. They did that on February 24th. And so it's, it's a kind of a long introduction. How is Europe going to accept defeat? Because Ukraine will be defeated. I have no idea about that because I have no idea what the final, uh, if I can use the word final solution or final goal of the Russian is. What, what do they, what, because uh, denazify, uh, demilitarize, what does it mean exactly? It's not so clear. And uh, I don't think they can, they will or they can or they desire to conquer the whole of Ukraine and they haven't liberated the whole of Donbass. So suppose the Donbass is free and suppose also Kherson and uh, some, where, where are they going to go? Are they going to go all the way to Odessa? I don't know. I just don't know what they want to do. I would, uh, I would advise uh, prudence, but. Uh, uh, nothing <laughs> put into it. Well, the problem, the problem with prudence is that the Russians really can't allow the Zelensky gang to stay in power because the Zelensky people, they're just going to continue with the war. I mean, they, they, you know, they basically got a blank check. The Americans are giving them a blank check, which means, you know, whatever you want, we're going to keep supplying you with the arms, which means they can continue to lob missiles and artillery into the Donbass, maybe even into Crimea, they can just go on doing it for years. So that's why I don't think the Russians can just simply accept the, you know, the Zelensky crowd staying in power. If I could just follow up on that before you answer, we have this mantra in the West of, and I think it's very silly, but it, it sounds nice, a win-win situation. We need a win-win situation. There is no win-win situation and Russia will win and it will define it how it wins and to add on to that, and George and I have talked about this at great length, the Russians are not gonna do this five years from now. They're not gonna do it 10 years from now again. This, they're not going to go through this again. They want something that's very definitive. Mm. But how do you see them winning? Because it seems to me that the, you know, the, the front line are not moving very much. Well, I mean, the, one of the things I have surmised, and this is only my opinion, there, and I'm not sourcing it for anyone, it's just my observation. But a couple of weeks ago, again, George and I talk about this almost every single day, but it, it, it dawned on me, because that phrase that came out of Afghanistan, you have the clocks, but we have the time. And I, I'm, I'm beginning to think there's, some, there's something to that, because if this slow grind going west, you have to understand at the same time, you have these local, um, regional authorities, local authority, authorities, they're seeing what's going on here and which side, which, because they'll, they're, you know, they would be, a lot of them, uh, Russian speakers, ethnic Russians have had enough of this Kiev regime even before the conflict. And they, but they need to feel secure that if they make a choice, they make the right choice and they're not gonna be punished from, uh, for it by Kiev. And so, as at the end of this month, beginning of next month, we could see a number of uh, uh, referenda. And you know, basically pe people are gonna say, you gotta go with us or you gotta go with, with Kiev. And all the while, 
The postal system is getting to work again. Schools are opening up again. Civil society is beginning to function. And I think that's one of the things that, again, the Russians don't want to go through this uh, five, 10 years from now. They want a, a definitive answer. Now, th my, my fundamental view of this is, and, and it's not what um, Moscow is going to control, it's what Kiev will control, a rump state. Go ahead. But what do you think? Um, don't you think that the more they, they move to the West, the more uh, they find people who are less Russian, less uh, Russian speaking, etc. I mean, the, you know, uh, it, I, the, I, east, I'm the far east is, of course, Russian, the far west is totally anti Russian. But then in between, if you move in, you see, it's a continuum. In Belgium, for example, the country has a, there's a linguistic border that divides French speaking from Dutch speaking. And it's a well, it's more or less well defined line. But uh, because these are two different languages, but I guess Russian and uh, Ukrainians are more related. So if you move from east to west, you will get more and more Ukrainians. And then I don't know how far the Russians are going. Well, I think to it's, it's, it depends on whether Maybe. they've defeated the Ukrainian armed forces. If they've substantially defeated and that there really is nothing left of the Ukrainian armed forces, and sooner or later, there will be nothing left. I mean, they're taking such a pounding and they're taking such heavy casualties that there will come a point that there's, there's going to be nothing left, in which case I think they will be, Russians will be in a position to dictate terms uh, mm -hmm. to Kiev, which is, I, I think, uh, I, either the departure of Zelensky um, or, a, uh, or a peace agreement that is absolutely uh, set in stone. Um, but I think that, but I, I, you know, I think Peter is right. The, the Russians said, look, we made a mistake in 2014. We didn't do it didn't get the job done in 2014. And so we paid for it for eight years with, you know, lost 13, 14, 15,000 lives. We can't do this again. We can't just sort of, you know, have a halfway house and then, you know, the Kiev starts it all up again. So I think one, once I think the armed forces are, are defeated, um, then I think Russia will be in a position to dictate terms. Yeah, we have to see. I mean, I, I, I uh... I don't like to make predictions, especially about war, because um, you don't know how. Uh, but you think the okay, maybe you're right. I mean, I often listen to the Duran, and they make the same analysis, also that uh, the Russians are grinding down the, you know, the Russian are grinding down the forces of Ukraine. But we'll see. We'll see. Uh, one one thing which is certain for me is that we are going to go towards a very grave economic crisis in the West. And what I'm really curious about is what is going to be the reaction to that from the masses and from the elites. I mean, are the elites going to, uh, is the capitalist, you see, it's always say the, I even made a joke saying the true left now in Germany are the capitalists because they are the ones who are interested in peace. <laughs> they need to survive. I mean, they're going to run. I mean, suppose, suppose even it's temporary. But suppose your, your cost increase enormously because of increased energy cost. I mean, I can live with maybe two or three degrees less, but an industry needs a certain amount of energy just to function. So if the, the cost increases, the cost increases, okay. So you lose markets abroad, okay? You, you lose competitiveness, or you lose to the Indians, to the Chinese, to the Japanese, et cetera. How, how do you get them back once the energy costs go down? It's not so easy because once you have lost the market, you have lost the market. I mean, people are, get used to buying some other things. How are the Germans? So the, the loss can be permanent, even for me, having two degrees less, not traveling, etc. It's an inconvenience, but then when it goes back to normal, I can, uh, you know, I, I can go to normal life. But the company is not the same thing. And I think it's going to be uh, a permanent damage to the whole economy of the of Europe and particularly of Germany, which was the sort of the powerhouse of Europe. So it's, uh, I, I don't know if they realize that, but if they do, you know, they should, they should try to find the reverse gear. <laughs> do you think that, I mean, you were talking about Germany earlier about that there, there seems to be real signs of um, opposition within Germany. You know, there's this public letter written by various uh, German writers and intellectuals is is and and there also opposition within the German the Social Democrats. Do you think that's going to you know go in, in in momentum? I mean, is that is that is that a going thing that they can, that this is going to really take off this German opposition? Yeah, but you see, if I take for example the evolution of what I call the the other left, I mean the uh, the, the other left now is mostly the Greens, and the Greens are the most going yeah, the world. Yeah. So it, it, 
is such a change, you see, such a radical change. Uh, and they only kept from, you know, from, the, from their original movement, which was a pacifist movement in reality, uh, they have only kept this uh, social issue and probably they, they, they want to change gender. Apparently in Germany now you can change your gender without having any operation once a month. So next week <laughs> you have to call me Marie and the, week, the long after that you have to call me Jean-Philippe or something. Right. <laughs> I mean, it seems to me that the, it's, they have only kept the more ridiculous part of their agenda of social movement and then uh, they, they the, on the substantive thing, they're only on the far right. But, and, but are they also maybe hostile to German industry? Maybe, you know, that, you know, this is like polluting, it's bad for the environment. So maybe, oh. they, they, they're, maybe they're quite happy to see German industry just wiped out. Yeah, they think they, they is going to be clean if they produce everything in China, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but I mean, that also it means, okay, it'll be clean, uh, but we're going to be really poor. Uh, that, that's not going to work. I mean, no. if you look at the whole post-war experience for Europe, the reason why the European economic community worked and they're attempting to make the EU work because it was under, under the, two, the twin pillars of security and prosperity. Now they're going to get, they're not going to get either. Okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, sure. Maybe you'll have, you know, I mean, George and I have thought about this the Morgenthau plan is actually coming into play. Okay, it just took almost eighty years, but they're going to they're going to the Morgenthau plan. You just turn your Germany into this kind of pastoral place with no industry. Who would have thought? Yeah, but the Germans do that even more than the Americans. I mean, the Americans, yeah, they have. Uh, I don't. I don't think there is. Any, you see, I don't. I don't believe very much in plans. I mean, I think they. they I believe much more in the whole of ideology. That's why I'm a little bit different from most people on the left or the people who have a Marxist analysis who see the ruling class having nefarious plans. They may have nefarious plans, but many things are just reaction to, uh, given the age of reaction to events and the sanction business is really a reaction. So the first section did work. So we take more sanction, take more sanction, more sanction, and the more sanction. I mean, the, the, the thing, I mean, the most ridiculous, the recent thing which is ridiculous is this energy price cap, right? I mean, I go to my butcher and I say, look, I, I want to buy your milk at a certain price. And the butcher says, no, no, I don't sell it to you. Said, no, no, I'm, the I'm, not, I'm not paying anymore. Yeah, that's right. and, then, and then, of course, you can say, yes, fine, but then uh, you don't get meat. I mean, it, it would work only if all the buyers were doing that. Yeah. That's true. But why would the Chinese and the Indians? No, but, but, but the Russians account? would have to agree to it. The Russians have to agree to it for it to work. No, but of course you could force the Russian, but if everybody says we won't buy your stuff anymore, except at a certain price, then of course they would have to be forced to sell it. But if the Indians and the Chinese can buy at a discount price the Russian uh, gas and then sell it to the European under the, you know, under the cap, but <laughs> at the higher price, why would they want a price cap? I mean, it doesn't make any sense. I mean, again, these guys do these guys think for a minute, and that's the a plan made by this woman Yellen, who is at the head of the Federal Reserve in the United States. I mean, aren't these people understanding anything about how the free market work? And they are uh, fanatic about the free market. They don't understand right. the world. Think that even a physicist like me understands. Right. This doesn't mean it's. Uh, it, but, I mean, the, the intellectual right. decline of the West. I don't like to speak of decline in general because that's too complicated. But the intellectual decline of the political and media class and the intellectual. It's just unbelievable. Right. But it's interesting, though, you're talking about the ideology, because what exactly is this ideology? I mean, I think Russophobia, hatred for Russia, is obviously an integral part of the ideology. A hatred for Donald Trump is also a part of it. And there has to be some kind of a connection between the two. That there's, there's something about both Trump and Russia that just simply drives that kind of uh, our liberal political elites crazy. Well, um, Global, there is what you call, I'm not sure I would call it like that, but you call globalist. I mean, they, you know, they have, a, they have an agenda of the destruction of the nation state. And that, of course, is something which, um, you know, which is uh, a, a very big agenda, in the, which unites the liberal right, the economic liberal right, and the new left, the new left thinking that a world without borders and so on and so forth would be wonderful, which I don't think, but... Uh, which again, the old left didn't believe. Yeah, right. No, and I think that, um, yes, it's the, the nation state, but I think there's also some element of 
conservatism. I mean, I both represent a certain element of conservative. Now, Trump, you know, because he's, he, of his lifestyle, you know, he's a New Yorker and, you know, he's had, you know, his share of, you know, exuberance in, in his youth. He's, he's an odd apostle of, of conservatism, but he kind of is, um, you know, nation state, patriotism, uh, traditional values, families. He seems to be an advocate and obviously against wokeism, political correctness and so on. People identify Trumpism with that as they identify Russia with that. Yeah, yeah I mean, because the, one of the things that George and I have talked at great length about also is that um, the this, this globalist agenda, these these liberal elites, they they cannot they they can't consonant the idea of an alternative. Russia is an alternative with its its special uh, special um, uh, features and problems, but I mean, it, it is a uh, outwardly an, um, very proud um, conservative nation, family, religion, um, uh, um, um, respect for um, the older generation, venerating the, the past, um, no tearing down of statues here. Um, they're actually putting up statues to a, a wide variety of people that had different ideological views. The West cannot stand an alternative, and Russia is. Yeah, but you see, that's a big mistake of these liberals that they think that's an alternative. But I mean, for example, the, take an example which is further even from us from the, than the Russians is Chinese. Chinese certainly don't want to impose their system on us. So why would we want to impose the, our system on them? I mean, they are perfectly satisfied with their system. I think it works for them. It wouldn't work for us probably. I think Helmut Schmidt said that democracy is the only thing we have, but we shouldn't try to sell it to the Chinese. I mean, it's it's. it's it's just ridiculous to try. I mean, it's not going to work anyway, and uh, unless we make a war, which will be nuclear, I mean, it just doesn't make any sense. And they keep on uh, coming. I mean, this trust now is going to go gung ho against China, but China isn't going to attack Britain. Okay, <laughs> the only thing they could attack is Hong Kong, but Hong Kong is already Chinese, so there's nothing to be done about that. Okay, and it just doesn't. It's so irritating to this idea that I mean, the Russians don't threaten us with their values and so on. They have their values. And if we don't like their values, then we should argue against these values here. But you see, I resent very much this policy of values. And I have said that to leftist friends all over the, uh, for a long time, is that they have changed. Uh, for me, the policy, you determine the budget, you make the laws, you make the regulations, etc. Okay, But you don't discuss values. In fact, I think politicians should not do philosophy. They shouldn't do moral religions. And they should take care of what I call politics. But the left has decided that, ah, we need to be feminist, we need to be anti-racist, we need to do this, and we need to control the discourse, and we need to sue people who have the wrong thoughts and things like that, and ban them, and uh, all, the, all these things, okay? And I always say, look, you want to fight on that, uh, on that, on that, uh, in, in that uh, field, okay, but uh, then think about what the right is going to do. The right is going to come with patriotic values. And they're going to say, oh, but worship the heroes of the past and look at Napoleon and uh, look at this and look at that. And that's much more satisfactory for the individuals than being always told that you are guilty of racism, sexism, homophobia, anti-Semitism, and so on. And of course, they are going to win if you put the, but, but that's the people at the level of values. The, 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 you can, okay, I think, of course, you can be for or against abortion. That's regulated by law. but. Uh, all this discourse about values, I mean, people, let people think what they, they want. I mean, he, there was an imam now who's been kicked out of France. He was uh, for, he thought women should stay home and take care of the kids. Well, okay, so so what? I mean, that should not be a crime to say that. I mean, you know, you don't have to but, follow. Yeah, but it's very, very interesting because, you know, even conservatives, you just said Liz Truss, Boris Johnson, they never, never champion just those conservative values. You know, they're not going to say, you know no. what, you know, we should put up another statue of Churchill. You know, we should put up another statue of uh, Nelson and Wellington. You know, I think we, we haven't done enough to celebrate, uh, you know, uh, you know his, uh, our wartime generals. They would never say that. They are just as ashamed and apologetic about the, Britain's past as, as the liberals. I mean, you know, he, you know he, Boris Johnson, who's supposed to be a champion of Churchill, he was completely intimidated when the British version of Black Lives Matter started attacking Churchill's stature. He, he couldn't even bring himself to defend Churchill. Um, so I think the, what he did, George, he put him in a box. He put him in a box. He, you know, just a well, well, Churchill lived by the values of his time. I mean, you know, so he's saying, hey, 
He's supposed to be one of the greatest figures of, of English history and you can't even defend him. And so it's a very interesting when you say conservative values, Trump is the one who's just doing that. He's saying, yeah, I want conservative values. You know, I, I want to celebrate all the great things in, in America's past, you know, a space program, you know, you know our, our national heroes, Patton, MacArthur, I want to celebrate all of that. It's not getting much traction. So it's, it's very interesting with, I think, liberal values prevail against these uh, conservative well, values. But as I, say, I, I think it's a mistake on both sides, but I think it's a bigger mistake on the left because the discourse of the right is more satisfactory to most people, but they really stick to very conservative if I may say, view of politics, that politics deals with legislation and budget and so on and so forth. You can be inspired by values, but you should not become a professor of ethics to the population. That's not the role of the political class. I think politicians should discuss politics and, and I, politics. I think, I think it's not like hearing people either way, okay? Just let people like Churchill or not like Churchill, uh, like uh, women at home and I mean, just that's their personal life and that's it. It's interesting, you've said in our conversation, you've said a number of times, um, um, uh, the, the lack of uh, pursuing or supporting a peace agenda, which I think discursively is very, very interesting because I think that is a po that could have been, I don't think anymore, that could have been a possible way out of, you know, how do we bring peace to Europe instead of we, the Russians must be defeated. Oh, yeah, See, yeah. I think they took the wrong discursive, they took they, 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 the, the wrong narrative because if you say I'm for peace and we need peace in all of Europe, then you have a lot more room for maneuver, but they just, they decided, they've rejected, openly rejected this uh, um, discursive um, turn that could have worked to everyone's advantage, particularly who, the Ukrainian. Right, but who would have advocated that? The only person who I've heard saying that is Nigel Farage. I mean, that's the only, the only person, and they, they, I guess a figure on the right, but there's no, nobody else. I mean, you know, Le Pen a little bit, but you know, she had a shot, she lost decisively. So it's like, you know, who, who's gonna be advocating this, as you said, peace agenda, which at the time of um, Billy Brandt and Helmut Schmidt, you know, that, that had traction, but there's no one these days who, who can Why advocate is that. Why is that the case? As I say, I mean, I see that as a result of these ideological transformation that I mentioned, that they be, everybody has become, uh, you know, in uh, when 9-11 uh, occurred, there was an editorial in Le Monde saying we are all Americans, and in fact, we have all become Americans. I mean, the goal was already complaining about that. He was complaining about the Germans. Then he was complaining about us, I mean, Belgians and Northern, uh, of course. And he said the colonized like to be colonized. And uh, it's very difficult, as I say, the, the, the Woodstock, you know, the my generation, 68 generation was uh, not me particularly, but the generation was America is Woodstock, you know, I mean, it's free, free love and so on and so forth. Of course, it's, it's completely false because, in fact, it's, it's pretty conservative as a whole if you take the country, if you take part of the country at least. And, and the liberals are really, you know, not liberal in many ways. I mean, they're certainly not liberal as far as free speech is concerned. So they, they, they are, uh, those people are, uh, you know, I mean, I don't see anything to admire in the United States, neither the conservative nor the liberals. But... Uh, People have been, propaganda has been very effective. You must also see the transformation in the media. The media have become almost all oligopolistic, if that's the correct word, okay? I mean, and there is no, I mean, there is opposition media in the, in the social network, in the independent, you know, the, the, the website and of people like you, but, but, but it doesn't exist in, a, in print media, in the mainstream a, a TV, radio, etc. It's all absolutely homogeneous, uh, pro, in pro Western, what they call pro Western views, which I don't agree is pro Western in actual fact. But you know, so you, yeah. you're painting a very, very depressing picture. We're, we can't get out of this. It looks like it looks until and 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 you know maybe Zoom is the uh, the last frontier. And I wouldn't and that's a company and trade a publicly traded company. And so I mean we we could see Zoom come next. <coughs> For me, it's, it's very depressing because I'm not. I'm not so depressed because you see, I didn't expect the yellow vest in France, and the yellow vest in France revolted for a minor increase in in taxation of uh, uh, gas. You know, I mean, now it's way above what the increase. <laughs> It remains to be seen what happens. I mean, because everybody is saying, oh, it's due to Putin, it's due like this, there's nothing we can do about this. It's not true. Just leave the sanctions. Just leave the sanctions. I mean, I was asking somewhere in the street, people were asking me, do you sign a petition to tax the super profit? 
I said, no, I want to leave the sanctions. <laughs> Of course, you can take the super profit if you want, but the, the super profits come from the increase of the price of uh, you know uh, fuel and so on, and, and and that's due to the sanctions. So, I mean, if you leave the sanction, uh, you know these profits will disappear. But they, but nobody has a dares to go to the root of the issue, which are the that's, sanctions, because everybody well, right. we so have to again, pay. Goes, so. Right, but. France had a shot. I mean, France had a chance. You know, that was Le Pen. Le Pen would have lifted the sanctions. Um, and, uh, and Macron, well, not right away, but I mean, I mean, she, she, at least she was very critical of the sanctions. Um, that no, was a no. shot, that was a shot, you know, and there was an election, you know, people voted against her. They voted for the same, same thing that Macron was offering before. Yeah, but you see, that's again, it's this ideology of fascism. I mean, of course, there's nothing, there's nothing fascist in Le Pen, not even her father. They don't understand what fascism means, but they, they've they been trained in school, you know, oh, fascism, fascism, fascism. And then once you call somebody fascist, once you call somebody far right, uh, there is very, it's very difficult to, uh, um, you know, it's very difficult to overwhelm that uh, sentiment and combat that sentiment. So I don't know. Well, it, if that's what I find very depressing because we, we have talked a lot about ideology, but most of what I think the way the media portrays these things, these are like bumper stickers. I mean, you know, it, growing up, you know, going through the American university system, to call somebody a fascist was a pretty rare thing. I mean, you didn't go around throwing that word around, okay? And I mean, and I'm all of us are children of the Cold War, okay? So you were very careful about it. But now, you know, people throw away, throw, uh, throw around these terms here so callously without thinking about what they mean. I yeah. mean, if you disagree with me, you're you're a fascist. I mean, that's that wasn't always the case, okay? Yeah, yeah of course. I, I had a, a, a seminar of physics that was actually canceled under physical threats from anti-fascist. And the only thing that is fascist in me is my uh, position on free speech, which is, let's say, a classical, uh, classical one. That's all. There is that because I defended the free speech of uh, Dieudonné, if you know him. I mean, there are people like that, and uh, that was uh, considered fascist. I mean, uh, so the anti-fascist uh, students uh, uh, decided to uh, uh, attack physically my seminar if it took place, and then the university co-opting uh, canceled it. Well, this is very interesting because that's here, a physics seminar. It would never. I, I'm sure that that would not happen in any other country. I don't think anybody would be banned from giving a physics seminar for his political view in other countries. And whether you right. want to but this is kind of interesting because if um, you know the winter comes and uh, people are getting cold, people are getting hungry because of inflation. Yeah. Um, there are more and more demonstrations. In the in the streets in more and more countries, how do the authorities respond? Do they cave? They didn't cave over COVID, or will they then crack down? Will they um, use the means of repression, which they did very well during the COVID, um, and therefore they will just simply crack down on free speech as well? You know, we're going to essentially destroy all Putin propaganda outlets. That means all websites will be closed down, which are spreading Putin propaganda. So yes. which way will the authorities go? I have to use I have to use a very English expression, wait and see. <laughs> I mean, I can't <laughs> predict these things. I can't predict these things. I'm sorry. Uh, there is this, it's a very, I'm very curious. I would like to be able to jump uh, three or four months ahead and see what's going on, but uh, we have to wait. Well, one, one, one of the, as a European, um, I'm, I'm actually quite shocked because I studied modern European history at university and graduate school. And Europe in the 20th century had a very tragic run. It was very tragic. Um, and then you have this amazing uh, prosperity um, after the war going all the way into the 90s. And then we have this kind of neoliberal agenda where we have this huge transfers of wealth to the elites. But have Europeans forgotten what it's like to suffer? Well, I don't know. It depends whom you ask. I, mean, I still think there are lots of people who suffer. There are like 10 million people who are poor in France. That may not be a lot compared to other countries, but still, there are, I don't know. I don't know. When I walk in the streets, I see beggars everywhere. Huh? And they're not foreign. They're not well, I, uh, maybe just to kind of rephrase it, I mean, you know, one of the great miracles, I think, <clears throat> of the Western experience 
is the creation of middle classes, okay, where you have autonomy, you, you ha you're able to um, um, uh, consume, you have disposable income, you're, you have the ability to save, you have choices about make about life. I mean, all of these things now are, are on the line and it's something that was unthinkable um, um, uh, 40 years ago. Yeah, but you must realize that at the same time that there was this neoliberal period, people decided, oh, let's not have industries. It's much cheaper if people do things in China. Oh, raw materials, they come from abroad anyway. We don't care. Oh, let's destroy nuclear energy because it's dangerous and uh, uh, let's get rid of that. I mean, uh, that has been the ideology of uh, of the entire political class. And now they realize, ah, but we, uh, we, we don't eat, you know, computer games, we eat food and we need uh, energy to, to run things. And it's not just uh, uh, some more bureaucracy or some, uh, I don't know, some uh, tic tac or something. something yeah, like but that. I mean, but I find it very disingenuous, these elites that we're talking about. They don't want to live that way. They want their private jets. They want their prime stake. OK, oh. I mean, they, 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 they want to be able to have air conditioning uh, anytime they want the, the thermostat up. Any, no, I mean, they, 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 they're saying what a, a, a vision of how mankind should exist, but they're not going to live that way. There's a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, I mean, as energy prices go up and the I don't know if you have heard, but the uh, transportation grid in the United States, try to get a plane on time to another city, which is getting more and more difficult. It's getting more and more expensive. All during this time, the elites are flying in private jets more and more often, okay? Yeah. So, I mean, they're, they're preaching something that they don't want to live. And I find that really dangerous. I go back to, why do I meet, um, uh, say, the middle class? Well, the middle classes gave political stability, but if the middle classes don't, and this goes back to the election of 2016 in the United States, where people felt that, you know, that the elite's vision for the world isn't working for them. And, and now, we, you know, now we have the term, term, uh, turmoil in the United States where it, it's going in a very dangerous and reckless direction. That we, the whole point is, is that, you know, it's, it's okay to use an American, it, um, it's killing the goose that lays the golden egg. Well, that's true. But I think that's it, that, that's it in a way, I mean, that's what, what, what's been going on for some time, the deindustrialization, the idea that, well, we actually don't need to have industries, we don't need to manufacture, we don't need to produce, you know, we can live off finance, you know, we can, you know, we can, yeah. you know, we can just finance things abroad. And then, you know, here we have nice houses, we can rent things out, you know, hotels, you know, we can rent stuff out. So in other words, we have this life of just essentially a rentier economy and all the industry, you know, they'll be elsewhere. And we don't really need to have all these awful, horrible, polluting industries here. And I think that has been a, an ideology. The sort of the, you know, the, we don't need all this. Let, let somebody else have all these smokestack industries. Oh, yeah. uh, we can be prosperous without uh, manufacturing industry. Yeah, but you see, that's the whole of ideology. Also, you must you speak of the middle class, but there is a part of what you call the middle class, which are the intellectuals and the journalists and the, and the, all these people are uh, sort of shaping the ideology, and the ideology does not necessarily match the interest of the capitalists. Of course, they don't match the interest of the people either, but they have their specific interest, which is to give. A, prominent role to themselves and uh, you know it's like the priest and the regime and, and, and then of course these people have manufactured this ideology which is both convenient to some extent to the part of the capitalist mostly the financial sector and the military industrial complex but not necessarily to the industrial capitalist and uh, and certainly not to the population in general and though this idea of no border this idea of humanitarian intervention this idea of uh, deindustrialization which is linked to the green ideology. And then of course, there's also the repentance for the Holocaust. I mean, there is a whole mixture of quasi-religious ideologies that are yeah. uh, you know, nurtured by the intelligentsia or, or, and the political class, because the political class, you see the, the role of the media is enormous. I mean, it's very, the goal, for example, had absolute, con I mean, my reading is sort of memoirs and he had absolute content for the media, Cont absolute content. He, he didn't give a shit, I mean, he didn't give, he wouldn't care at all about the media were writing. In fact, he said, if they say good things about me, Le Monde and so on, that's, that's a bad sign, okay? 
So, but now, of course, they, they, no, no leader could conceivably go against the media. And so they do look at what the media are saying. And that, uh, so the, the, the intellectual class has an enormous responsibility in what's happening. Do, what do you, how do you react to the term liberal fascism? <laughs> I, I think it's not that adequate because one has to be, it's unfair to fascism. I mean, I mean, I mean in the sense, well, fascism was a collectivist movement, okay? I don't like it, but it was collectivist, okay? So was communism, of course. But then it was collectivist on the basis of the nation, the race, whatever, but nevertheless, oh, it's like, uh, of course, it's also true of religious movement. There, there's something Don't you have collectivism oh. of the elites? Ah, well, I wouldn't use that word because I, I, you know, I see what you mean, but I think that what I usually say now that the liberals, what people who call themselves liberal, which I think are very far away, maybe we don't agree on that, from classical liberalism of I ideals of the pre, you know, 18th century liberals. But anyway, I think they're very far from that, even they're far from what these people thought of the free market and of everything. But anyway, what people who call themselves liberals, I find them much more unpleasant than the people so-called far right or so-called fascists, because the so-called fascists are not fascists for one thing, and we can discuss with them. But the liberals are hateful beyond belief. I see that on Twitter, Facebook, etc. I mean, uh, they, 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 they unbelievable. I mean, yeah, you're a putting agent. The far right doesn't say that. I mean, they, I've had discussion with people of the so-called far right about immigration, about all kinds of subjects, but you can discuss with them. Well, they, 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 they yeah, you can. I agree with you, but don't you find it quite ironic that the support that the West has of Ukraine, considering the fascistic elements in Ukraine itself? I mean, that, it, that that's something that is just like, you can't you can't resolve. That's why you don't. No one is allowed to talk about it. Yeah, that's unbelievable. That if you are against immigration, there was a, a, a Russian diplomat which was interviewed in French. It was a very interesting interview. And she made a good point about fascism. She said, fascism in the West is if you are for the nation state, you're against immigration, you're for security, and sometimes you're a fascist. But in Ukraine, it's different. It's when you make, uh, you know, uh, marches with torches uh, in memory of uh, collaborators during the war. There's just nobody in France who does that, even nothing close to that, okay? It's nothing similar to that. They don't uh, destroy, uh, uh, you know, statues and don't erect statues uh, for Pétain or for Laval. But it's just nobody, it's just some one guy who says something on TV and then he's, he's uh, uh, almost, you know, he's, uh, uh, he says Pétain helped the Jews. Oh, that's not true. And, uh, okay, just one word. And it's not the same thing as in Ukraine. It's completely different. And then, of course, what happens here, I mean, it's very funny because you see these reporters, there, is a, there was a French TV and then you see two kids uh, there was a, uh, the, you know, the Ukrainian army passing and kids were saluting and then there were two girls who were saluting with a clear Nazi salute and they said, oh, no, 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 we asked them, eh, you don't understand our language, it's not a Nazi salute, it's something different, okay? But then there was a, this comedian, Dieudonné, this black comedian, who was making a, what they call a canal, he was making this gesture, which is very vulgar but it had nothing to do. And they say, that's an inverted Nazi salute. I mean, so they invented, <laughs> it has nothing to do. It's just a very- well, I mean, The interesting thing is that Zelensky, I don't remember what news outlet, I, mean, I think it was a British one. And they asked him about um, Azov and these other uh, uh, private sector and these groups. And he had a remarkable answer. And it was actually quite honest. He said, they are what they are. Yeah. Can I just go back to- <laughs> they, they, These people are useful idiots. They, they are being used. I mean, I don't think there's a real, if there was a real, you know, Nazi state in Ukraine, you wouldn't have the support from the Zionist and the Jewish establishment that you have for Ukraine now, because they're all, with very few exceptions, at least I see that in France, and I think in the US too, they're all behind uh, Ukraine, uh, behind Ukraine against Russia. It's also- But, so, but, a, lot also, of that, yeah, but a lot of that is also uh, political, after all, remember, my you know, enemies, enemies, no, my yeah, friend. Yeah, yeah, because, and, you know, for instance, in Yugoslavia, um, you had, you know, the liberals who were flagrantly on the side of Croatia. Yeah. Tuchman, Tuchman, you know, this wasn't just a bill oh, today's yeah. Croatia, Tuchman, who was openly an apologist for the Ustasha, and yet they supported him. Oh, he's a good guy. The Serbs, 
who were led by Milosevic would be the communists and you know part of the partisan tradition. Oh, they're the fascists. So so yeah, that, there's nothing unusual. Same with in the case of uh, the cost of Albanians. You know, so Albanians say they were kind of on the okay, other yeah, side. Yeah, so yeah, again, yeah. the liberals were on that side, and of course the same goes with the Muslims. I mean, you know, basically, I mean, what um, is that Begovic had actually been imprisoned for uh, after the war for you know basically being a Nazi. So. There's, there's nothing unusual in raising suddenly, suddenly liberals embracing and forgetting all about the, the Nazi, um, uh, uh, un unfortunate Nazi connections. It's embracing Al-Qaeda in Syria. Right. Of course, of course, they support the worst people everywhere. That's certainly true. And the, but the, but the, the contrast with the repression of free speech here is, is startling. I mean, just the same way, you know, Kosovo should be independent, but the, the Donbass should not be. Why exactly? We don't know. And Taiwan should be independent, but then why not the, why not the, I mean, Taiwan has been part of uh, uh, China for much, much longer. And of course, also, uh, then uh, Crimea has been part of uh, Ukraine, for example. I mean, there's no comparison. Right, right. I, I, it, 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 I'm very curious. I mean, uh, we, we've talked about the, con you know, within the control that the elites have and, and their control over the media, but do you come across the the conversation is that you know the Americans are not really our friend because Europe is being treated like a a, a poor stupid country bumpkin cousin. I mean it's it, it's it's extraordinary. Yeah. I mean is it, is there any kind of realization that you know our this is not really our friend? You and and you can believe that and still not like Russia. Of course, of course, there are people like that, but there. Are the remnants of goldism, but uh, I know some people like that, Mia, a guy named Mia, but they are very marginal, even in the so-called Republicans, uh, French Republicans. And of course, they don't exist in the Macron regime, and of course, not on the left. So yeah, you have that, you have that, you have some leftover of that in the communists, but again, it's very marginal. So the, it's all the Golo communism on both sides is very marginal. But what, what about the people who are supporters of Le Pen? Do they have that attitude? You know. The Americans are not our friends. I don't know them very well, I must say, but I think it's they are narrow-minded. They are mostly, you know, obsessed with Muslims and immigration, etc., which is a problem. But I don't think it's the main problem. They, they, they are not even against European Union, you know. And uh, also, the father Le Pen at some point was very pro-Reagan and Atlanticist. That's a very positive. I mean, they. You see, they have knee-jerk reactions, okay? They have knee-jerk reactions, so they don't have a deep analysis like the goal had of the international situation. And uh, also, the goal, it's difficult for uh, somebody in that party to be goalist because of uh, the Algerian war. I mean, even, uh, you know, even Marine Le Pen said that, yeah, there was a, because there was this big split about, the, of course, the Algerian war is way, way past and they should forget about it, but, you know, there's been this huge split. And so the founder of the party was very much against the goal uh, because of Algeria, and of course, also because of Pétain, if you go even further. I don't think that's relevant now, but I know one person who is the, one of the leaders of the uh, uh, Rassemblement National in National Assembly, whom I think calls himself Gaullist, and he seems to be Gaullist in, in, in many ways, but it, it, it's just difficult. It's just difficult. And the, the obsession is much easier for them to be obsessed with Muslims, of course, because that's the Muslims are the punching punching bag. Everybody loves to hate them, and uh, and then of course immigrants and security, which are a real problem. But I don't think they have a very clear geopolitical view. And of course, when Marine Le Pen says a word about Russia or she borrows money from Russia and so on, then everybody jumps on them. You're pro Putin, etc. I mean, in, okay. you see, they have also they don't don't forget the Russia Gate. The Russia Gate was a complete scam, as far as I know. Okay, I think you're a journalist, yes, you know, yeah. it's a complete scam. It's still repeated. And then they, 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 that gave the impression that Putin is out to conquer the West. And they're going to, and they've said that the Democrats in, in the US, and the, they really say that the, the 2016 election was a coup. It was a coup. It was a Manchurian candidate, Trump, and he was uh, under the, you know, and uh, in fact, he took more sanctions against Russia than anybody else. And uh, I mean, even that wasn't enough to, uh, you know, to make sure that he wasn't a Russian puppet. And, and, and this idea that they manipulate the election also exists here, even though there is no evidence whatsoever. But it's evidence-free. Everybody knows Putin is out to conquer the world. It's a new Hitler and so on. 
One other question. I, you were saying... I think I think the, the reaction, if it comes, will not come from the intellectuals and political class, but it may come just like the yellow vest from the masses. I mean, the yellow vest had zero, essentially zero support in the beginning among uh, the intellectuals and, uh, and the southern journalists. And in fact, the left, the unions, and someone said, well, aren't they fascist? Uh, you see, they, there's always this sort of worry that they might be fascist, you know? And so, uh, uh, populist, okay, that they call populist also. And uh, that's going to happen this winter. There is a revolt against. Uh... Right. So, just one, one thing you were talking about um, one of the ideologies uh, that um, uh, you, you listed a number of ideologies, and one of them was the sort of expiation of guilt um, over the Holocaust. But I was just wondering about that, and it's something that Peter and I have talked about is that this strange obsession particularly in the United States that uh, intellectuals have, or journalists, you know, rather than intellectuals, intellectuals do grand journalists have with Hitler and Stalin. This idea that somehow, you know, you, you know I, if you're on the right, you know, it's everything is Stalin. Stalin, you know, Mao, you know, Pol Pot. And on the left is everything is Hitler. It, how, how do you explain this? The strange obsession with events from 90 years ago. Again, it's a sort of, well, okay. Stalin is a bit different, but Hitler, the, 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 the thing about the Holocaust, of course, is fueled by the pro-Israel lobbies. Huh? That, uh, that is certainly something which has to be said. I mean, they, they are reminding ourselves all the time. I mean, the, every year there is the Hafle du Veldif, you know, when the Jews were rounded up in Paris and so on in July uh, 1942, 1943. And uh, of course, it was horrible, but now they have to celebrate each year and they have to feel guilty about it. And they have to say, well, let's make sure it doesn't repeat itself. But how could it possibly repeat itself? Uh, Germany, uh, France was occupied by Germany. France cannot be occupied by Germany nowadays. Uh, Germany isn't going to become Nazis tomorrow. I mean, it just doesn't make any sense. And the French would never have done that if they had been uh, independent. There is no sign that Pétain would have been in power. And even if he had been in power, it would have been within the constitution of the well, it, 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 For me, it, it, it's, a, it's a lazy moral imperative. You know, well, th that's what it is. I mean, uh, the number of times I've seen on cable TV in the United States, well, that's appeasement, that's Munich. Yeah, yeah. But, 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 but there was, there's been a few occasions where someone will say, well, what do you mean by Munich? And they don't know. They just, it's just a, a label. It's a label. And then there was one case on MSNBC. He said, well, in, in Munich in 1939, they didn't even get the date right. <laughs> okay. I know, I know, I know. No, they, that's a, yeah, they, they, they have no idea what's happened. Then. And, they, and then, of course, there is the pact, which we'll occurred a, a year later. And then they say the war is due to the pact. And I mean, it just, everything is screwed up completely. There is no there is no knowledge of history in these elites. You see, the Gaulle knew history very, very well. And uh, uh, so, so did some other people in his generation. In, in that, uh, but now the, the journalists and so on, they have no, no, no understanding of history, certainly, but not even knowledge of history. And I think this uh, constant, I mean, the guilt about the Holocaust is turning, is making, is, has become a joke. I mean, people make jokes about it. And I think it's backfiring, in fact, I think it fuels anti-Semitism, if anything, if it does anything, it's fuel anti-Semitism because people are fed up and it's, it's understandable. You don't have to hold me responsible for things that a regime that ended, ended seven years before my birth and I am quite old, okay? So uh, the younger generation don't, don't care at all about that. I and mean, it just doesn't make, this has nothing to do except to excite us against the new Hitler, which is now Putin, the Hitler du jour. I mean, Hitler could be Gaddafi, it could be Saddam, it could be Assad, it could be, you know, and now it's 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 Putin. And because Putin is at least at the head of a strong power, strong country, you know, unlike the other guys who are not at the head of a strong countries, uh, it becomes sort of... Uh, but see, know. doesn't that create a, a trap? And this is something I talked about in my program for years now. But when you call someone a leader in the world, you call him Hitler, then, then you. Then how do you how do you unring that bell? You can't. Okay. And this is this is a, a trap that they, the West has created for itself. Okay. Exactly. Because it, it, they, you can't have negotiations because it, 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 for me that this is what's so and, and they do it because they care quote unquote they care about Ukraine. 
Well, if they cared about Ukraine, they would stop all of this, but they, they put themselves into a box, like they put Churchill in a box. Yeah, 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 of course. They, they, they don't, yeah, of course, that's a, that's a good point. I mean, they have created a situation where they can't uh, sort of, you know, uh, reverse gear. I mean, there's no reverse gear. They can't say, well, Putin is not really Hitler, and, uh, you know, and uh, maybe we should uh, negotiate with them. The idea, I mean, okay, if there has to be peace in Ukraine, at some point, there will have to be negotiation between the Ukrainians and the, uh, and the Russians. But of course, between the Ukrainians means with NATO. And then of course, NATO does not, they, they may suffer from the economic consequences, but they don't suffer from loss of people, etc. They just send weapons, but that's, you know, that's money. So of course, they, they do suffer in the long term, but they don't suffer immediately. So they have not much of an incentive unless there is unrest in the West uh, because of economic consequences. They have no incentive to, uh, to, to, to make- there's no, there's no incentive and there's no way that the United States is going to stop because even though the Europeans, I mean, it doesn't look like the Europeans are sending anything anymore. I don't think they've got anything to send. So, but the United States is just gonna keep doing it. And the United States has already told Zelensky, hey, name whatever you want, we're gonna give, give it to you. And they're gonna just keep doing it and doing it because you know, they're in the grip of this idea that we're going to bring Russia to its knees, or at least we're going to hurt them so badly that they'll never be a great power again. And, you know, maybe it'll take us a year, two years, three years, you know, we're just going to keep doing it. We just want to hurt Russia as much as we can. I mean, and that that's, you know, that the Americans often think in those terms. I mean, that's what they're doing in Syria. They just can keep punishing Assad because he defied us. But in the end, they lost, huh? Even in Syria, they lost. Right, they did. They, they didn't open yeah. a new base. They have apparently opened a new base, but how long are they going? You see, the cru the crux of the matter in in Syria, and that must be credited to Putin, is the shift in the position of Erdogan. If Erdogan makes peace with Syria, then the situation of the Americans become precarious, because the Americans are of course supported by Kurdish faction who are again against Turkey. But if Turkey, uh, you know, gets out of the game or uh, you know there is peace, then uh, then I think Syria can sort of turn and uh, try to harass the American bases. I mean, the, you, you may not be able to go in an allowed war against the Americans, but you can uh, accidentally, so to speak, send a missile or something like that. Or the Iranians can do that, or they can be uh, commando operation. And so and So I think that they, they lost. I mean, they lost. They certainly lost the idea of. Uh, Overthrowing Assad, so I think they will probably lose in Ukraine. But that, but, they, but they're still punishing. Syria. They're still punishing Syria, even though, yeah, yeah oh. they, 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 the plan to overthrow Assad, yeah, that that failed. So they can just keep hurting Syria as much as they can, starve them, deny them oil revenue, just just cause as it's, much pain. It's, it's monstrous. Everything they do is monstrous. I mean, you just. Uh, I mean, everything they, they blame Russia for doing, they do 10 times worse. Even if you agree with all the propaganda that they say about Russia, I maintain that the case of what the Americans are doing in Latin America and the Middle East, now in East, in China, in, you know, in Asia and so on, what they have done in Asia in the past is just unbelievably worse. Well, Jean, I mean, this is a really interesting um, discussion. So thank you so much for uh, giving us your time and your insights. Next time we'll get on to quantum mechanics. Um... <laughs> <laughs> but, but, that will be a lecture, okay? And I'll just be <laughs> nodding my head. No, no, I, uh, I, I, you can send me the, the, the link to the video. Yeah, yes, we will. Yes, okay. So thank you so much. And I hope to talk to you again very thank soon. You. So okay. remember, if you like the gaggle, please like, share, and subscribe. See you soon. Bye.